And without any further ado, I am so honored to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jorg Ehrman, who will be presenting spondyloarthritis treatment and research updates. Dr. Ehrman is a rheumatologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital and assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School in Boston. He is a native of Germany and received his MD from the University of Leipzig. After a postdoctoral fellowship in immunology at Stanford University, an internal medicine residency at the University of Tennessee in Memphis, he completed his rheumatology, his training in rheumatology at Brigham and Women's Hospital. His laboratory investigates disease mechanisms in spondyloarthritis using mouse models and translational research approaches. He is the chair of Spartan, which is the spondyloarthritis research and treatment network, uh, an organization of North American rheumatologists dedicated to spondyloarthritis, and a STEAM member of SAE's medical board. Welcome, Dr. Ehrman. We're so grateful and excited to have you with us today. I'm going to stop sharing so you can now share. There you go. Yeah. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, so thank you very much for the introduction and uh, good afternoon or good morning to everyone in the audience. I was given the task to provide an update on spinal arthritis treatment, treatment and research, which is really a huge topic. And uh, we only have 45 minutes, so I had to uh, be somewhat selective here. Uh, so I will not provide a comprehensive update on treatment and research, uh, but we do have questions during the uh, a time during the question and answer session. So if I leave something out and uh, it interests you, then please ask uh, during the Q&A. I divided my uh, presentation into three parts, uh, past, present, and future. And uh, so let's start with the past. So the spinal arthritis concept uh, that, that we use today is the result of a historical development. And that's shown on this slide. And uh, one can distinguish roughly three phases. The first phase here on the left in blue uh, was the description of the individual diseases that uh, make up uh, the uh, spondyl arthritis. Psoriatic arthritis was the first one to be described that happened in the early 19th century. Uh, ankylosing spondylitis was uh, described in the 1890s, although the term ankylosing spondylitis was uh, first used in 1904 and reactive arthritis uh, was first described during the First World War. The second phase in the center in red uh, is characterized by the recognition that the spinal arthritis are a family of uh, related diseases that are distinct from rheumatoid arthritis. So until then, it was thought that all these diseases are really variants of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, a term that was often used for ankylosing spondylitis, for instance, was rheumatoid spondylitis. Uh, but during that uh, period, uh, there was a number of, of developments that ultimately led to the, to the recognition that this is a separate uh, disease entity. Uh, and a very important paper was published in 1974 that I'm going to introduce on the next slide that, that really generated this, uh, this concept of, of spondyl arthritis. And the most recent phase is the one on the right. And this phase has been characterized by the development of classification criteria of the disease to bring some order into the chaos. And importantly, uh, this phase has also been uh, characterized by the uh, development of uh, effective therapies for the first time. Uh, until then, uh, the treatment options were really rather limited. So in the mid 20th century, for instance, Ankylosing spondylitis was treated with radiation therapy, which was effective, uh, but had um, huge uh, side effects because it was realized shortly thereafter that patients after radiation developed cancers. And the uh, non-steroidals really started to, to become available only in the 1960s. So uh, a lot of uh, 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 this really has, has changed uh, more recently. So, so this is the spinal arthritis concept in 1974, as proposed by Moll and Wright. So Werner Wright was a professor of uh, rheumatology in Leeds in the UK, and he worked with uh, uh, his co-workers in this field, and John Moll was one of his disciples. Uh, 
And they published this paper in, in 1974. Uh, the group in Leeds had a number of uh, patient cohorts, uh, patients with uh, psoriatic arthritis, patients with uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease that they studied that also included uh, a lot of families with multiple uh, family members with a, with a disease and uh, uh, with, with arthritis. And through the uh, very careful analysis of these patient cohorts, they realized that these various uh, diseases were really related. And that one thing that they had in common was a, a high frequency of sacroiliitis or real ankylosing spondylitis. And so they came up with this idea of the seronegative uh, spondarthritides with ankylosing spondylitis in the center and these other related diseases uh, that overlap with ankylosing spondylitis. The spondyloarthritis concept uh, that we have today in 2022 looks a little different. Um, and uh, it looks somewhat like this. So one important aspect is that we distinguish between uh, patients who have predominantly axial disease manifestations here on the left and uh, those with predominantly peripheral disease manifestations on the right. Axial spondyloarthritis includes classical ankylosing spondylitis, but also patients who have similar symptoms uh, due to inflammation in their spine, but they do not have the classical x-ray features of ankylosing spondylitis. And then the prototypic peripheral spondyloarthritis is psoriatic arthritis, although some psoriatic arthritis patients also have axial disease. And then we have patients with uh, IBD-associated spondyloarthritis and reactive arthritis that can have both, uh, both uh, axial and peripheral features. And then there are also patients who seem to have spondyloarthritis, but they cannot clearly put into, into one of these other categories. And then obviously there's also this big overlap with non-rheumatic diseases, in particular inflammatory bowel disease and psoriasis. Uh, so we know uh, that up to 20% of patients with inflammatory bowel disease and up to 30% of patients with psoriasis uh, develop uh, spondyloarthritis in their lifetime. And we also know that patients with spondyloarthritis uh, may have inflammatory bowel disease and a large percentage has subclinical inflammation in their guts. So they have inflammation when you look, for instance, with biopsy, even though they don't have symptoms. So these uh, diseases are all uh, very related. So that gets us to the present. And uh, in this section, I really want to focus on uh, the current treatments that we have available. And I'm going to start with a discussion of the randomized controlled uh, uh, um, placebo, the randomized double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trial, because that is the, the workhorse of research in this field. And I think it's important that, that uh, everyone understands where the knowledge about the effective treatments comes from. So typically, um, a, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial compares two drugs, uh, uh, two, two arms, uh, patients either receive drug or placebo. The study starts with an enrollment phase. Uh, so um, a, pa a study population is defined. So this could, for instance, be a population of patients with ankylosing spondylitis and the modified New York criteria for ankylosing spondylitis uh, are used to identify uh, the, the subjects who are allowed to enter the study. And then typically this also includes uh, criteria for disease severity. So a minimum amount of disease severity is required to enter the study. And then uh, there are typically also some exclusion criteria. So for instance, if uh, patients have certain uh, uh, other diseases or a history of, of infections, they, they cannot participate in the study. And then once the patients are enrolled, they are randomized to one of the two treatment arms. And uh, then um, they, they start treatment and uh, during the first phase uh, there is blinding. So both the patient or the subject in the study and also the physician who assesses the, treat, uh, the, the efficacy during that time are, do, do not know which arm the, the, the subject is in, whether the uh, participant in the study receives the drug or the placebo. And this goes up to the primary endpoint of the study which in ankylosing spondylitis or axial spondyloarthritis is typically at 12 or 16 weeks after initiation of therapy. And so, so this is really the, the critical phase of the randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Uh, 
So all of these elements that, that are in the name are active here. And why do we do that? The reason is to uh, uh, um, help us to really understand whether a drug works and to distinguish the drug effect from the placebo effect, which can be quite big. So in some studies, a substantial portion of the study uh, population um, uh, will have a, a response even though they, they uh, receive an inactive compound, the, the placebo. And we can discuss if, you, if you're interested in this, what potential reasons are for this. Uh, but this is the, the, uh, the, the, the critical phase uh, to determine whether a drug works or not. And then typically in today's world, uh, the clinical trial doesn't stop at the primary endpoint, but it, uh, it is extended. And the patients who were initially treated with placebo then also receive the study drug. And that has uh, uh, two, there are two reasons for this. Number one, uh, we want the, uh, the subjects who participate in the study and receive the placebo to also have the, the benefits, the potential benefits of the medication. But it's also important to have a larger number of, uh, of study participants who receive the drug to be able to look for potential side effects. And so, so this is the main reason for this open label extension phase, which is, can be a year, sometimes also two or three years, um, to understand better what the potential adverse events are when patients are treated with the studied medication. So the primary endpoint is uh, the most important result of the clinical trial. And the primary endpoint ultimately um, determines whether the clinical trial is a success or a failure. And so the whole trial is scaled in terms of how many patients participate uh, based on this primary outcome. And a typically used uh, primary outcome is the ASAS 40 or the ASAS 20 response. And this is the fraction of participants in the, in the trial who have at least a 40 or 20% improvement of their symptoms. And already uh, I mentioned that the open label extension phase along with the, the initial uh, blinded phase uh, are uh, very important to look at safety data, which is also a critical outcome of the clinical trial. So what are the treatment options for uh, spinal arthritis that we have available uh, in 2022? Uh, and there's a number of treatment recommendations from uh, various organizations. I want to point out that we have the ACR, SAA, Spartan treatment recommendations for axial spinal arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, there have been two versions of, of, of these recommendations. The first set was published in 2016. There was an update in 2019. And we are currently working on uh, uh, getting another update started that incorporates more recent developments in uh, uh, the, the treatment of axial spinal arthritis. As you can see here, there are treatment recommendations for axial spinal arthritis and AS, as well as for psoriatic arthritis. There are no treatment recommendations specifically for patients, for instance, with reactive arthritis or IBD-associated spinal arthritis. And there are also hardly any clinical trial data for these, uh, for these conditions. So typically, uh, if uh, we encounter patients with, with these types of uh, uh, or these variants of spinal arthritis, we extrapolate from the clinical trial data for axial spinal arthritis and AS or for psoriatic arthritis. So let's look at um, axial spinal arthritis and AS first. So on top, we have the first line uh, treatment uh, uh, options that includes non-steroidal anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. drugs and uh, physical therapy. And there's a large number of non-steroidals that, that are uh, available uh, at the uh, level of, of groups of patients, they all work equally well. Although the clinical experience in the, is that at the individual level, that is not the case. So uh, individual patients may really have very different responses to one or the other of these, of these non-steroidals. Uh, and the reasons for, for this are not entirely clear. It probably has something to do with genetics uh, but that is not uh, well understood uh, um, because NSAIDs are not a very sexy research topic uh, in, in today's world. And then in the bottom row here, uh, we have uh, the biologics, the TNF inhibitors, the IL-17A inhibitors, and the JAK inhibitors as the most recent entry uh, 
uh, into the uh, treatment uh, options for, for axial spinal arthritis. So, so these two drugs here, tofacitinib and upadacitinib, were FDA approved for the treatment of ankylosing spondylitis within the last year. Um, TNF and IL-17A are soluble mediators that are produced by inflammatory cells. And so these biologics that target these mediators, they capture them outside of the cells and inhibit their, their effect uh, on, uh, on other cells. The JAK inhibitors work very differently. And I'm summarizing this on, on this next slide. So the TNF inhibitors and the IL-17A inhibitors that we have currently available, they are protein drugs. And because of this, they have to be given either as a subcutaneous or an IV injection. Because if you eat them, uh, the, the, our guts will digest the proteins and uh, uh, we cannot absorb these, these, these medications uh, into, our, into, into our body. Because they are proteins, they uh, may also cause an immune response and uh, this immune response can lead to the formation of anti-drug antibodies that can then inactivate uh, uh, the, the drug after a period of time once the, the drug is started. That can be an issue with long-term uh, uh, treatment uh, using biologics. I already mentioned that the biologics work outside of cells and they are highly specific for one mediator. So for instance, TNF inhibitors only inactivate TNF and no other cytokines, no other soluble mediators that might play a role in the disease process. The JAK inhibitors, on the other hand, are very different. So, so uh, they are also called targeted synthetic DMARTs. So these are small molecules. Uh, they have a chemical formula and uh, you can give them as a tablet because these small molecules are able to then uh, get absorbed in the gut and enter the bloodstream through the intestine. They are not immunogenic, so we do not see a problem with anti-drug antibody formation. And they also have a very different mechanism of action. So uh, these small molecules enter the cells, so they diffuse into the cell and then inhibit signaling pathways inside of cells. And they're not as specific. So uh, the, the JAK inhibitors, they inhibit an enzyme called Janus kinase, and there are four types of them. Um, and uh, these JAK kinases uh, affect or are downstream, uh, they play a role in multiple uh, signaling pathways of multiple cytokines. So the JAK inhibitors are more promiscuous, so they in affect multiple uh, signaling pathways. Nevertheless, if we look at the efficacy of these different uh, inhibitors uh, in the treatment of ankylosing spondylitis, they all work about the same. So I've compiled on this slide here the uh, results of various clinical trials of TNF inhibitors on the left, IL-17A inhibitors in the center, and then the JAK inhibitors on the right. And uh, on the y-axis here, you have the ASAS-20 response. And uh, so you see that across the board, uh, the results in the, uh, in the drug-treated group versus the placebo groups are highly comparable. Uh, to date, we have no head-to-head -head studies. So uh, none of these uh, medications have been compared in the same clinical trial. But if you just compare the, the outcomes uh, uh, using the, the published data for the individual studies, they are very similar. The, uh, and these were responses for ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, several of the medications have also been tested formally in clinical trials in non-radiographic axial spinal arthritis. Um, this was the first uh, clinical trial of, of that, that attempted that. So this was uh, one of the TNF inhibitors, sertralizumab. And for, for these uh, patients with non-radiographic disease, the FDA actually uh, de, um, required that the primary endpoint is at, uh, at one year. But what you can see here is that the response uh, uh, was uh, um, very prominent so patients treated with the TNF inhibitor had a, an excellent response early on, and that was maintained over the course of the, uh, of the year uh, in contrast to the patients who were treated with, with placebo. So, well, if, if all of these drugs work pretty much the same, so what are the factors that determine the choice of therapy in, in the individual patient? And this is something um, that um, 
comes up uh, you know on a daily basis in, in in the in the in the clinic office and there's a number of factors that play a role first of all uh, symptom severity so so this is in particularly or particularly important at the initiation of of therapy so the question of uh, do we start uh, a biologic or a JAK inhibitor uh, or are the uh, non-steroidals and physical therapy, are they um, sufficient to control the symptoms? Um, and then a second factor is uh, the presence of other disease manifestations. So um, does the patient also have a history of uveitis, psoriasis or inflammatory bowel disease? Um, so psoriasis, for instance, in particular, if it's severe, responds much better to inhibition uh, of IL-17A than inhibition of TNF. So this could be a factor that uh, plays a role in making treatment decisions. And then also the presence of comorbidities. So comorbidities are diseases that are not directly related uh, to spondyloarthritis, uh, but are present in the individual. So for instance, kidney disease is one important factor uh, because if someone has impaired kidney function, then we would not use non-steroidals which have a potential toxic effect uh, on, on kidneys, in particular if there's pre-existing damage. And then of course, uh, factors to consider are the response to previous treatments or a history of adverse events. And last but not least, access also plays an important role. Um, this is something that uh, um, we encounter very frequently because insurance plans have different uh, rules uh, uh, for different diseases, uh, which drugs are available. And so often in clinical practice at the time of the clinic visit, we don't really know which medications are available for, uh, uh, for, for treatment. And that then needs to be sorted out after the, after the clinic visit because insurance plans have certain preferences for uh, certain types of TNF inhibitors or IL-17A inhibitors. Physical therapy, as I, as I showed in a previous slide, is an important aspect of treatment. So this is non-pharmacological uh, treatment. Um, there has been a number of studies that have shown that physical therapy improves uh, uh, symptoms and, and well-being. Uh, and physical therapy is also strongly recommended by the ACR SAA Spartan treatment guidelines. Um, nevertheless, in clinical practice, physical therapy is something that, that is often a little neglected because we focus probably too much on, on just relying on, on, uh, on drug therapy. Um, physical therapy uh, is important in all phases of the disease, but probably most important in ankylosing spondylitis in patients who have uh, some syndesmophytes in their spine, because here uh, regular uh, range of motion stretching exercises are very important in order to maintain um, function. Um, and so it's important uh, to focus on posture and gait, uh, make sure to focus on walking upright, uh, avoiding prolonged stooping and bending and doing regular stretching and range of motion exercises. And of course, physical therapy has also uh, beyond uh, the, the role in, uh, in, in spinal arthritis specifically, regular physical activity has uh, a, a very important role. Uh, with regard to general health and well-being. One question that I get very frequently asked is, um, what about diet? And so when you look this up on the internet, there's a, a lot of information about potential dietary interventions that includes uh, fasting, um, gluten-free diets, anti-inflammatory diets, probiotics, uh, vitamins, and certain dietary supplements. Um, however, the the, the bottom line is that we really know very little about what is truly effective. Um, uh, there was one systematic literature review that I found from 2018, and uh, this systematic review of the literature identified just 10 articles um, that uh, were of sufficient quality to be included in the study. Uh, none of these articles were from the S or from Canada. And even those articles were criticized by the authors of this uh, systematic literature review to have a number of methodological flaws. And they ultimately concluded that there's little evidence regarding the fact that aspects of diet influence the severity of ankylosing spondylitis or are part of its etiology. So, so clearly there is a 
knowledge gap in this area and um, we really uh, need to know more about um, the impact of diet on uh, uh, treatment responses. Another question that, that often comes up is, uh, does therapy inhibit uh, disease progression? Or patients may also ask that uh, slightly differently after seeing uh, images like this. So uh, am I going to look like this 20 years from now? And uh, so a number of, of, of uh, um, things um, are important here. Number one, um, the disease course in axial spondyloarthritis and ankylosing spondylitis is highly variable. Um, this was looked at here uh, in an older cohort of patients before the biologic uh, uh, therapy, uh, uh, biological therapies became available. And so, so each of these colored lines is an individual patient and the, the graph shows the radiographic progression measured using the MSAS, which I'm going to explain in a second. And you can see that there's really a huge difference in um, how um, um, rapidly there is progression or whether there's any progression at all because quite a number of patients did not have progression. Um, we know that a number of factors um, are risk factors for radiographic progression. Uh, male sex and being HLA-B27 are risk factors that we cannot change. Uh, but high CRP, so a high degree of inflammatory activity and cigarette smoking are risk factors that can be, that can be changed uh, by uh, quitting or uh, with uh, potent anti-inflammatory therapy. And then the presence of syndesmophytes in the lumbar or cervical spine at baseline is also a risk factor. And so that suggests that uh, starting treatment early, recognizing and making a diagnosis early may also have a beneficial impact. So this slide here uh, shows you what the EMSAS is. So the EMSAS is a research tool. It relies on radiographs, x-rays of the cervical and lumbar spine. And so here we see an image of the cervical spine from the side. And so the, the reader who scores the EMSAS will then look at the corners of the vertebral bodies here and give a score of zero to three to each of these vertebral corners. And so this is done in the cervical and then the lumbar spine. And so that gives a total score of zero to 72. And so then uh, the imaging studies can be performed again after a, a certain period of time. And has been shown that it's, it requires at least a, a, a number of two years until you can actually see any differences. And then one can calculate the difference in the MSAS between the follow-up and the baseline. And so as you can see here, most of the patients uh, actually show no progression. So the change in the MSAS over two years is, uh, is, is zero or just a plus minus a, a couple of points between two and zero. And there's only a few patients who really have a significant uh, progression during that time. And so in this study here, this, we actually see, uh, uh, we, we see two curves here that are overlapping. And so this was a, a study that compared radiographic progression patients treated with a TNF inhibitor and fliximab and a uh, control group that was not treated with the biologic. And there was really no difference with regard to radiographic progression in this study. Um, since then, so this was, this was shown about 15 years ago. And since then, a number of studies have, uh, have looked at this using other approaches. Um, and um, the most recent systematic reviews of this topic come to the conclusion that while there is no short-term benefit, and short-term here means like two years of treatment, but uh, long-term treatment, four years or, or more, actually does appear to have an impact on radiographic progression. So that's good news. Uh, in all likelihood, uh, this is also true for the other uh, types of treatment that we have. So for the IL-17A inhibitors and the JAK inhibitors, but these medications are newer, so they haven't been studied as well. Just want to mention this study here uh, that is currently ongoing and we're expecting results uh, later this year. So, so this is the first head-to-head -head study in ankylosing spondylitis. And this study here compares treatment with an IL-17A inhibitor with a TNF inhibitor. And the primary endpoint is the change in the MSAS after two years. 
So, so this is a very different uh, trial design compared to what we discussed earlier. So here, the input is actually change in radiographic, uh, is radiographic progression the change in the AMSAS. And so uh, I'm, I'm curious to see what the study will show, whether there is a difference in treatment with uh, an IL-17 inhibitor or a TNF inhibitor with regard to radiographic progression. But I think the bottom line uh, uh, that uh, um, what I want to point out here is that all evidence at the, at the moment points in the direction that uh, treatment with biologics or JAK inhibitors actually does have an impact and reduces the risk for radiographic progression. Now, what about peripheral spondyloarthritis? So on this slide here, I've, I've, sh I'm, I've listed the medications that are available for the treatment of psoriatic arthritis, uh, which, as I said, uh, is, is typically peripheral arthritis. And you see more groups than on the previous slide for axial spondyloarthritis. And so this is because there's a number of medications uh, highlighted in blue right here um, that work for peripheral arthritis, but they do not work for axial inflammation. So that includes, for instance, the conventional disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs like methotrexate and sulfasalazine. So, so methotrexate in particular is the uh, anchor drug for rheumatoid arthritis. It also has some efficacy in psoriatic arthritis, but it does not work for axial spondyloarthritis. And why that is, is not entirely clear. I want to focus uh, on the IL-1223 inhibitors because here, um, this, this, uh, this question of why do they not work uh, became even more Im important as a, a more recent development. So, so interleukin-23 is, is another cytokine, so similar to TNF or interleukin-17A. And there were multiple lines of evidence in the literature that uh, uh, suggested that interleukin-23 or IL-23 really plays a central role in the disease pathogenesis of axial spondyloarthritis and AS. And therefore, inhibition of the cytokine really should be a major, uh, should result in a major improvement in symptoms. So what are these, these lines of evidence? So for instance, genome-wide association studies that were performed uh, over the last uh, 10, 15 years showed that there are multiple genetic polymorphisms in genes related to IL-23 receptor signaling that are associated with ankylosing spondylitis. And then there's also a lot of animal data. So for instance, if you overexpress IL-23 in mice, so if you make sure that there's a lot of IL-23 around in mice, then these mice actually develop a disease that looks like spondyloarthritis. But then when drugs became available and uh, inhibition of IL-23 was, was uh, attempted uh, in the clinic, it didn't work in ankylosing spondylitis. So on the left here, we have the results of a clinical trial in psoriatic arthritis with ustekinumab, which inhibits IL-23 and also this other cytokine. Um, um, and so you see that there was a significant difference in the groups treated with the drug versus placebo. But then the same trial design in ankylosing spondylitis failed to show a difference. So that was a big surprise uh, for the field. Um, and um, a number of potential explanations have been, have been proposed. Uh, my favorite uh, explanation is the one that I've highlighted in blue here at the bottom, and that is that IL-23 may play a role during the initiation of the disease, um, but is not important once the uh, disease is established in the spine. And there, there is one example that, that shows that this might actually be the case from, from a rat model of spondyloarthritis. And I want to walk you through this. So HLA-B27 transgenic rats uh, develop a disease that, that resembles human spondyloarthritis. And in this study here, uh, they used this model and they were able to actually trigger the, the disease so that the rats develop the disease around the same time uh, by injecting an, in, uh, injecting an immune stimulus into these rats. And you can see here that after the uh, induction of the disease, um, the rats develop arthritis. But when they, uh, uh, so this is actually the curve for, uh, for spondylitis, and this is the curve for arthritis. Uh, but when they treat the rats with an antibody that blocks the L23 receptor signals, when they start injecting this prior to disease onset, 
then the recipients of the antibody are completely protected from the development of inflammation in their spines and in their paws. On the other hand, if they start the treatment after the disease had started to appear, they were not able to prevent the disease from happening in the animals, neither spondylitis nor arthritis. So, th so this is an example that that timing actually may have a, a major role here. And uh, uh, one hypothesis is that this may actually have something to do with where the disease starts and where it ultimately uh, causes symptoms. So there is some evidence that uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis or axial spondyloarthritis actually starts in the intestine. And maybe uh, this immune response in the gut is dependent on IL-23, but then when months or years later, the inflammation uh, affects uh, the sacroiliac joints and the spine uh, uh, is at that point where the IL-23 does not play a role anymore. So what are the factors that, it, that determine the choice of therapy in, in peripheral spinal arthritis? And, uh, and so uh, to, to make that point here, I, I, I'm just showing this slide that is from the most recent treatment recommendations for psoriatic arthritis published earlier this year uh, from the GRAPA group. And so what they uh, recommend here is that it really depends on the spectrum of disease manifestations uh, in the individual patient. So uh, depending on whether there's predominantly peripheral arthritis or axial inflammation or psoriasis, nail psoriasis or inflammatory bowel disease, then it is important to choose the medication or the, the type of medications that are best uh, for the, the uh, disease manifestations that, that are of, have the most impact on the life of, of, of the patient. So disease manifestations play a role as we discussed for axial disease and of, of course uh, the other factors um, that uh, we discussed earlier also have uh, a role here. So let's uh, at the end take a, a brief look at the future. This is from uh, a review that I recently wrote together with Victoria Navarro Campan and Desnes Podobny from, uh, from Europe. And so uh, in this review, we discussed where the unmet, the critical unmet needs are in uh, the management and treatment of patients with spinal arthritis. And we identified two major areas. One is to make a, a diagnosis early and then to have better therapeutic strategy for management. And so making diagnosis re uh, would require to have better biomarkers both laboratory biomarkers and imaging biomarkers to make a diagnosis. And then on the treatment side, um, there is still a need for new drug targets, but also a need for better matching the available therapies with the individual patient. So the uh, magic word here is precision medicine. And so the, the last few slides, I just want to highlight a few developments in, in this field. So first, let's have a look at imaging. So currently, we are still relying on uh, radiographs of the SI joints as the basic imaging modality for making a diagnosis. Uh, and this is an approach that has been around since the 1930s. Um, the benefits of, of using um, plain radiographs is that the, this is a technique that's readily available and it's very inexpensive, but it also has a number of disadvantages. So we get a, just a two-dimensional image of a very complicated three-dimensional structure and, and often there is overlying bowel content and so it can be very difficult to correctly assess these eye joints. Uh, X-ray images also do not show inflammation and so uh, they will not show any abnormalities in patients with early ankylosing spondylitis or non-radiographic disease and of course radiographs are associated with radiation exposure. So uh, fortunately we have now MRI available and uh, when an MRI is ordered, what we are mostly looking for is evidence for inflammation. So on the left here, this is an inflammation-sensitive inflammation MRI sequence called STIR. And just imagine you're standing at the foot end of the person and you're looking up. And so what we're seeing here is the bony pelvis. And so there is the right SI joint here and the left SI joint on the other side. And there are these white areas just next to these eye joints. 
And this is what we call bone marrow edema. And this is a feature of active sacroiliitis. So that's the most important uh, feature that we're looking for when an MRI is ordered uh, uh, to look at SI joint inflammation. And fortunately, bone marrow edema can also be found in a number of, of other situations. So uh, studies have found um, bone marrow edema in healthy uh, adults, in particular in physically active uh, individuals like athletes, military recruits, and also in postpartum women. And so uh, bone marrow edema alone uh, may not be sufficient to really make a precise diagnosis. And there's now increased interest in uh, looking at very fine structural lesions. Uh, and those structural lesions are much better um, to uh, detect it using CT than a CAT scan imaging than MRI imaging. However, traditional CT imaging, again, has a lot of radiation exposure, uh, and there are uh, now low-dose CT options to get around that, but the more, the cooler and, and more fascinating approach is this one here, and this is called bone MRI or synthetic MRI. And so here, um, an algorithm is used to transform MRI images into images that look like CT images. And if you compare the traditional CT image on the top left here with this synthetic CT image at the bottom left here, they are really very similar. And you can see very nicely the erosion here and here in the bone underneath the SI joints on the, uh, on the MR derived image. You can even generate uh, these very cool 3D renderings of the pelvis that one then can turn in, in three dimensional space using uh, MR as the input. Now, this is still research, uh, but I would expect that in the not so distant future, uh, this will also become uh, available in the clinic and help making a diagnosis. Um, the development of this algorithm to generate these synthetic CT images actually relied on machine learning. And so this is a big buzzword in, in, uh, in research probably right now in many areas. Um, the radiologists are at the forefront of this, but machine learning and artificial intelligence can be used wherever um, large data sets are available. And so I would expect that uh, in rheumatology, including in this monarthritis field, machine learning and artificial intelligence will uh, be a, a big topic in the not so distant future. And then here I slide about new drug targets and treatment strategies. Um, so there's a number of, of new drugs that are currently in clinical trials. Um, probably the most immediate impact are, uh, uh, and the most, uh, the, the drugs that will very likely hit um, the clinical practice fairly soon are these combined IL-17AF inhibitors that are in, in clinical trials. Uh, additional JAK inhibitors are in clinical trials. And then there are a few uh, other uh, uh, treatment modalities that, that are a little, um, um, uh, that are in, in earlier phases of, of clinical development. So uh, there is a, a, a mediator called GMCSF that, for instance, that's being targeted in, in an early clinical trial. Um, a, a very interesting field that's emerging is also the approach or the idea to combine existing drugs. Uh, this is something that was uh, thought about many years ago uh, after the TNF inhibitors became available, but uh, it proved to be uh, associated with a very high risk for side effects. Um, uh, however, a more recent uh, clinical trial in ulcerative colitis uh, uh, revisited this question and they showed very good data, both with regard to efficacy and with regard to side effects when uh, uh, an IL-23 inhibitor and a TNF inhibitor were combined. Uh, and so now uh, th this is something that, that uh, people, people are, are thinking about. So what are good combinations that would make sense uh, and what are the potential toxicity risks here? So, but I'm sure we will hear more about uh, the, these combinations. And then finally, um, there's also development in the basic research field where uh, experiments in, um, in mice, for instance, uh, have demonstrated that uh, a number of, uh, a couple of other inhibitors um, uh, work actually in, in animals and might be uh, um, good candidate treatments uh, for, for patients with, with spinal arthritis. 
For instance, this one here, MIF, macrophage inhibitory factor, uh, was shown in a very prominent pa uh, paper last year to be highly effective in a mouse model of spondyloarthritis. Ultimately, um, the development of new therapies really requires that we have a better understanding of, of the disease process. And, and there's really, I think, the, the biggest need at, at the moment. And I say this also because my background is more in uh, basic and translational research. Um, and so how can we get there? Uh, th this slide here uh, is a slide that I borrowed from Louis Puch, who is a, a skin pathologist. And it shows us a very complex, complex network of cells and mediators that play a role in the pathogenesis of psoriasis. Uh, I don't think that anyone in the world would be able to draw a similar cartoon for what's happening in the joints of patients with psoriatic arthritis or in the spines of patients with ankylosing spondylitis or axial spondyloarthritis because we simply don't have the data, because we don't have easy access to biopsy specimens. And so this is where I want to talk about AMP. AMP is the Accelerating Medicines Partnership, and, and this is a very big project, a strategic partnership between public and private sector that involves the NIH, a number of pharmaceutical companies and nonprofit organizations. And uh, AMP is now in its second phase. The first phase ran from 2014 until last year and focused on uh, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, uh, but the second phase of AMP, called AMP-AIM, uh, is uh, uh, now also involves uh, Sjogren's syndrome, but also psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And what happens in this in this project is that um, academic centers across the U.S. Uh, collaborate in um, obtaining tissue specimens. So the focus here really is on cellular and molecular analysis of tissue specimens rather than peripheral blood. And then there are standardized protocol for the collection of, of these tissues. And this, uh, the tissues are then sent to a central uh, center where they are processed uh, 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 along uh, or together. And state-of-the-art methods for single cell analysis are applied to learn about uh, the, uh, more about the, the cells that, that are found in the diseased tissue. And so, so what then happens is, is shown here. So for instance, this is an example where uh, 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 tissue is obtained from an inflamed uh, joint with rheumatoid arthritis. Then the tissue is dis uh, disaggregate, disaggregated to, ident uh, to generate single cells. And then there's a number of, uh, of techniques now available to, to very comprehensively look at these cells. So there's flow cytometry, where um, up to 40 or 50 parameters per cell can be measured. But you can also then perform single cell RNA sequencing where the whole genome or the whole transcriptome of individual cells can be, can be probed. And there's a lot that can be learned without actually making assumptions about what one might find. And so the, the approach or the studies in rheumatoid arthritis and lupus were so successful and resulted in a number of very high profile and very informative papers that uh, AMP was uh, extended and is now in its second phase. Unfortunately, uh, while they included psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, uh, axial spinal arthritis was not included in, in, in AMP2. Um, and so, uh, but, but uh, uh, there are approaches to do something similar. And so this is a study that we are running at my institution uh, at a much smaller scale. We, call this BACSPA, biopsy in axial spinal arthritis. And the idea here is to obtain MRI-guided uh, biopsies uh, from the inflamed tissue uh, around these eye joints that I showed you earlier on this, on this MRI scan. And then we can uh, use this tissue specimen to do histology and to do a single cell analysis with flow cytometry or RNA sequencing as described in the, in the AMP cartoon. So this was our first uh, uh, attempt to do an MRI-guided biopsy. This is actually me because I was uh, study participant number one. And we see again the SI joints. This is the right SI joint. This is the left SI joint. And just next to it here, this is where the needle is in the pelvic bone. Uh, we have by now performed eight of these procedures. And I can say that they uh, were uh, well tolerated. We haven't had any uh, uh, significant adverse events. Uh, 
um, and the histology is pending. So if this presentation had been a couple of weeks later, I probably, I, I actually could have uh, shown you some histology, uh, but they're currently in the core facility for processing. And with this, I'm at the end of my presentation and I look forward to the question and answer session. Thank you so much, Dr. Ehrman, for that informative presentation. You've, uh, it's just so much fantastic content you've managed to pack into 45 minutes. Thank you so much. I know we certainly gave you a, a challenge and you've, you've just been, it's been a fantastic presentation. Thank you very, very much. We will be, here we go, moving into our Q&A session here. Um, so I've received a number of questions already. If, uh, if you haven't submitted your questions yet, please go ahead and do so. You can type them into the Q&A module at the bottom of your screen, and I will read them out loud for Dr. Ehrman to answer, getting to as many as we can in the time that we have. So I would like to begin with the following question. Is it true that AS doesn't cause back pain, only discomfort? I have been told that by a rheumatologist when I share that pain reduces me down to tears. Um, well, that's not an easy question to answer. Uh, pain is something very subjective. Um, although we know that there are you know, correlates of, of pain with uh, uh, activity in, in the brain, but um, how, um, to what degree uh, individuals experience pain really varies a lot. So um, I, would not be dismissive about the severity of pain and use that uh, as a um, as an indicator of whether the pain is due to ankylosing spondylitis or not. Thank you very much. Um, is there any early information, either studies or case reports, showing that JAK inhibitors might treat anterior uveitis? So, yes, there there are early early studies. Um, I was at a conference um, uh, a, a month ago where um, results of such a study were reported. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, was a study of um, the JAK inhibitor filgotinib um, that, is, that is not uh, approved for, for ankylosing spondylitis in the, in the US. And that study suggested that there is benefit for the treatment of anterior uveitis. Um, but uh, so this this is very early data, uh, not published yet, as far as I know. Um, so you have to take that with a grain of salt. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so so we have a number of questions on diet coming in already. So let's begin with with this one. Why isn't there more research? Do you think into dietary changes that would benefit spondyloarthritis? There are so many suggested diets out there. Um, can what I eat influence my microbiome or inflammation? How are those related? Well, that's just, it's two questions at least. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, let me start with the, with the second one. Uh, so for sure, what we eat has an impact on the microbiome. Um, so uh, we, we have about a thousand different types of bacteria in the gut. And um, the, the ratio between these bacteria and what they do um, uh, you know, can certainly be influenced by uh, what we eat or whether we, uh, uh, you know, also take probiotics. So this is going to have an impact for sure. Um, uh, but whether, whether these changes really have an, uh, then ultimately rich, uh, uh, result in, in changes in symptoms, that is an area that is, that is not well understood. So, so why is there not more research in this area? I, I think that uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a number of things that I'm sure play a, ro uh, play a role. One is that it's not so easy to perform studies well in this field um, because, you know, I, I, I discussed the, the design of a, um, uh, you know, randomized uh, double-blind placebo-controlled trial that tells us whether a drug is effective, yes or no. Uh, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to do a similar study with 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 regard to diet, uh, because uh, you know we eat so many things in the course of the day or in the course of a week, uh, 
so to, to make uh, good comparisons here is, is much more difficult. So, so that's, that's one uh, explanation. Um, another explanation is certainly also, um, you know, where, where does the money come from for, for this kind of study? Um, uh, how big would a good study have to be in order to get reliable data? Um, so, so, so there's, there's really also a lot of methodolo methodological questions uh, about, uh, you know, um, how, to, how to design a good trial in this field. Uh, but I, I think there is a need for, for really for more information about this. Yeah, there's definitely so much to talk about. Um, a couple of other questions kind of related to that are vegan or vegetarian diets, um, you know, reducing animal products, uh, plant-based diets, fiber. Um, what, what findings, you know, might you be able to point to in regard to, to those particular um, ways of eating? Um, what I can say is I, I would recommend uh, experimentation um, because we don't have reliable data on these things. And, um, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not enough to do a, a study where you have a group of people, you, you give them a dietary intervention, and then, uh, you know, two weeks later, they feel better. Um, that could be a simple placebo effect, whether it has something to do with the specific diet, dietary intervention. Is, is, is you cannot uh, um, understand from, from this kind of study. And, and therefore, we, we really don't have reliable data. So what I would suggest is um, to, to do some experimentation, try different types of diet, and see what the impact is on, on how well you feel. Um, uh, you know, obviously, the dietary interventions should not be extreme uh, so that they cause harm. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, uh, um, reasonable, uh, uh, um, you know, changes to the diet, I think that's something that, that uh, one can just uh, uh, try and, and do, use a trial and error approach. Makes sense. Thank you very much. Um, what do we know about the role of estrogen in women who have spondyloarthritis? Yeah, so this is not my, uh, my specialty. Um, you know, it's a it's a um, a um, an active field of of investigation. So, how does the disease phenotype, or how does the uh, disease, how do the disease mechanisms potentially differ in in men and women with the disease? And if if you uh, look at, at then difference between men and women, um, sex hormones obviously play a major role. Um, but uh, whether, uh, for instance, uh, the, the, the higher frequency um, of, of axial spinal arthritis in men compared to women is related to uh, the, the, the differences in sex hormones, that is not clear. So um, it's essentially um, the, the hormonal differences between men and women at this point are more, um, you know, a hypothetical answer to the question of what what's different between men and women with the disease. Thank you. Um, can we discuss the, um, I have a question on, discuss the use of hydrochloroquine for radiographic AS patients with bony changes, as well as for peripheral spa? So I don't know of any data that support the use of hydroxychloroquine uh, for uh, radio for axial disease, and um, hydroxychloroquine is not a medication that's very effective in um, in spinal arthritis, psoriatic arthritis. Uh, we use it a lot in patients with uh, with peripheral arthritis, uh, with seronegative rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. Um, but it is not very effective in, in, in uh, uh, PSA or spinal arthritis. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, can we talk a bit more about synthes fomites and how they form in spinal arthritis? Yeah, so synthes fomites are these um, bony protrusions that, that form at, um, at the corners of, of vertebral bodies. Um, the we don't have a, a, a complete sort of understanding of, of what happens there. Um, the one sort of general concept um, 
postulates that initially there's inflammation, and then this inflammation uh, may result in some degree of destruction and a healing response that is exaggerated. So instead of simply resulting in uh, 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 the dying out of the inflammation, there is abnormal uh, new bone formation. So similar to uh, like a, a exaggerated scar formation that, that some people have. Um, so why is the inflammation uh, in those places? And so one school of thought has it that um, the, the edges of the vertebral bodies are under a lot of mechanical stress because there are some uh, uh, tendon fibers that attach to the bone. And, um, and this is what, what, what drives the, the inflammation uh, um, and, and uh, this is what results in the, in the localization of inflammation to those spots. Um, but it's, it's not, uh, you know, 100%, not everyone will, will agree with that. But, but I think that, uh, so just to summarize, the, the syndesmophytes seem to be an exaggerated healing response to inflammation. So we can, some supportive evidence comes actually from, uh, from imaging studies. So um, when you look at serial images of initially MRI studies and later on then X-ray studies, that there is there's a higher likelihood that initially there was inflammation at a vertebral corner where subsequently a syndesmophyte forms. But the, the, the relationship is not 100%. So I, I hope if, if that was too confusing, then then please uh, uh, type it again in the in the in the in the question box, and I, I will try again. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm not seeing it come through just yet, so I'm hoping. Oh, we will see. <laughs> that was what the person was wanting to hear. Um. Okay, let's talk about. Combination therapy is a cornerstone of treatment many diseases. Yeah. Diabetes, hypertension. Um, why the concern of increased side effects in spinal thyroid arthritis with combination treatment, do you think? Also, why uh, in SPA is combination pharmacology more, um, I guess, not a standard? Yeah. So I think we have to, to distinguish between different types of combinations. So uh, we, we use combination therapy all the time, for instance, in rheumatoid arthritis. But it is a combination of a conventional DMARC methotrexate with a biologic or with a JAK inhibitor. Um, so, so that that is that is standard. Um, the, 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 as, I, as I mentioned, methotrexate does not work in um, in, in ankylosing spondylitis. But to some degree, we do co uh, combination therapy by combining an NSAID with the biologic. Now, the the, the other. Uh, a type of combination therapy, and this is what I was alluding to with, with my slide towards the end of the presentation, is to combine two biologics or to combine a biologic and a JAK inhibitor. So why isn't that standard? The, there's a bit of a history to this. So, so this was tried about 15 years ago or so in rheumatoid arthritis when uh, the early um, biologics were available and the, the drugs that were tested at that time TNF inhibitors and IL-1 inhibitors, um, when combined, really resulted in a substantial increase in the risk for uh, for infections, mm -hmm. and and therefore the, the the rheumatology field backed off and said, well, we, we cannot really do that. Uh, a related point is also that uh, uh, two biologics combined is a very expensive uh, type of therapy, and I think because of that, that this has been uh, this area of investigation has been relatively quiet, uh, but there is now an increased interest in this. And, and I think it ultimately depends on what types of inhibitors one combines, uh, where uh, uh, actually the risk for, uh, for infections may not increase all that dramatically. At least the, uh, I mentioned one study on, on my slide in, in, in Altstoff colitis, um, where uh, a, an IL-23 inhibitor and a TNF inhibitor were combined. And um, the, the increase, there was no major increase, it seems, in, in risk for infections. Um, but uh, just to go back to the, to the question, so this is not just a concern uh, uh, with regard to the risk for infections with regard to uh, spinal arthritis. This, this is generally a concern uh, 
when you combine these very potent anti-inflammatory therapies that, that there is a cost that we might pay in uh, with regard to an increased risk for, for serious infections. So interesting. Thank you so much. It was a great topic to, to dive into a bit here. Um, let me see. So do, in terms of, um, you know, what, what might, what might kind of bring about uh, onset of spinal bone arthritis, is there any, anything, any research pointing to, um, either, you know, spinal injuries or, or is there anything to look at that might bring on spinal bone arthritis in someone who's predisposed, but hasn't developed it yet? Um, yeah, so a very good question. Uh, I mean, it goes to the heart of our understanding of the, of the disease. Um, you know, the, the, the general um, concept uh, uh, about the development of these diseases is that there's genetic predisposition and then uh, environmental factors that, that are also required. Um, so uh, genetic predisposition, for instance, involves HLA-B27 and a, a bunch of other genes. For instance, these um, polymorphisms in the IL-23 receptor uh, uh, signaling pathway that I mentioned. And so, so what are the what are the environmental factors that could contribute? So, and there are different schools of thought. So, so some people uh, really think that the the critical um, environmental factors is what happens in the gut, um, because there is evidence for dysbiosis, for abnormalities in the composition of the gut bacteria, and and so this dysbiosis may have an impact on immune responses in the gut or elsewhere in the body and thereby then trigger inflammation leading to spinal arthritis. Uh, another school of thought is that um, uh, the environmental factor is actually mechanical injury. So, so the, the, your question was, is, is, is actually goes in that, in that direction. So, so for instance, if we think about uh, a tennis elbow, which uh, can happen in someone with overuse um, of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the upper extremity, and so in um, uh, this type of injury may happen very frequently um, and may not even always be symptomatic, but in patients with the genetic predisposition to develop spinal arthritis, this injury then may actually trigger an exaggerated inflammatory response, which becomes chronic and then ultimately appears as, as spinal arthritis. Um, so, so I think that th these are the, the two major theories right now the the um, that that that, uh, that that are discussed so so that there is uh, with regard to environmental factors so the the dysbiosis hypothesis and and the mechanical stress hypothesis thank you so much may i ask are you uh, do you have is there one that you are more compelled to to believe is um, happens more commonly or carries more weight are both kind of equally? I, I, I actually favor the, the, the hypothesis or the, the combination of the two mm -hmm. that, that might actually be important. So yes, there, there, uh, there could be this uh, uh, micro injury um, that, that happens, but then uh, when at the same time you have um, you know, activated cells that come from the gut or some other mediators that, that come from the gut, if they are present at the right moment, this may then result in, 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 the, um, in, in spinal arthritis. So, so I, I believe in the combination of the two. Thank you very much. Um, in layman's term, how does my non radiographic spinal arthritis cause my back to ache after three or four hours of sleep or rest? and yet doesn't hurt during the day. So what are the kind of mechanical things that are Yes, so, excellent, inside? excellent question. Excellent <laughs> question. Um, there, is no, there is no clear answer to this, uh, I, which always strikes me because it's sort of, it's, it's a question that goes to the heart of, of what the disease is about. Because, you know, we, the first thing we ask, uh, you know, when we inquire, about symptoms is, is, you know, does it wake you up from sleep and how do you feel in the morning? And, and so this is a major, you know, factor, the clinical factor that we, that we use to distinguish uh, inflammatory back pain from uh, mechanical back pain, yet we do not understand the mechanism. Mm 
um, there is probably, you know, you know, the, the, the question is, you know, who, who would fund that kind of research? Um, mm. I, it's probably likely so, um, but, but to, to, to really try to try a serious uh, answer here. Um, so, so we, we have, um, uh, biological clocks, we have diurnal rhythms. So certain things in our internal environment change over the course of the, of the day. So, uh, so there are, um, um, variation. So uh, in, in, in certain hormones, um, and also inflammatory mediators that, that differ depending on at what time of the day you measure this. Um, this is, has been shown for some, uh, uh mediators, uh, and, and some hormones, um, uh, better understood actually in rheumatoid arthritis, where there's also morning stiffness. It's very predominant when, when people wake up with, with their, with their peripheral joints being stiff and, and hurting more than later in the day. And so probably because of these circadian rhythms, there is a peak of inflammatory activity um, in after midnight in the early hours of the of the day. And because of this, there is uh, uh, um, there are worse symptoms at that time. And then um, w even without any um, um, uh, medication, just because of the, 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 the biorhythm, uh, later in the day, the symptoms are better. And then uh, 24 hours later, they, they, they peak again. So it probably has something to do with these circadian rhythms of, uh, of, of mediators that, 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 uh, um, that mediate those, those symptoms. Um, but what these are, we, we don't know. So for instance, the question of what is morning stiffness? Um, is not answered. Uh, at least I don't know the answer to, to this. Uh, uh, is this, um, you know, wh wh why do we feel? Why do patients feel stiff when they when they wake up uh, with 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 spinal arthritis? That that is that is not uh, understood. Thank you so much. Such such fantastic questions our audience is yeah, yeah. providing us today. Thank you, everyone. Please keep it up. We have just about uh, 15 minutes left, so we will try our best to get to as many of these fantastic questions as we can. Um, okay, let's talk a bit about medications. Um, are there, what studies are there on the long-term side effects or risks of biologic use, biologic medication use? So um, well, what we do know is we have now quite a bit of experience with, with in particular with the TNF inhibitors, but also with the IL-17A inhibitors um, because they've been around for a number of years. So, so what I can say is that, that there is no cumulative risk. So what does it mean? There are risks associated with using these medications, but it doesn't matter whether you've been on a TNF inhibitor for one year or whether you have been on a TNF inhibitor for 10 years, the risks don't go up. And I hope that this is what, what you were asking. Yeah, so uh, the, the, if, if you're tolerating the, the medication okay, the risks do not go up over time, mm. but they don't disappear. Yeah, so they, they're sort of at a, at a steady level. Interesting, so someone who's been taking it for three years versus someone who's been taking it for 10 years, um, their risks really wouldn't differ. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Um, biosimilars, you know, they're, they've been around for a little bit. It seems like they're going to be more used um, this year and next year in the spa space. What, what can we say on those? Do you, do you find them equally as effective as the original reference biologic medications? Uh, what should patients know about these medications? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, there was a lot of anxiety about this, uh, 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 not just amongst patients, also amongst rheumatologists about what, what happens with the biologics. Um, but you know, we, for, at least for, uh, for some of them, we have now some experience with, 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 with biosimilars. And I would say this is, uh, the, the experience has been overall very positive, uh, that they work just as well as the uh, original drugs and that's how they um, are supposed to function yeah so uh, that that's the the idea of a biosimilar that it has a similar uh, uh, efficacy compared to to the original molecule 
Um, what else can I say about biosimilars? Yeah. So, and and perhaps for 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 anyone in the audience who isn't quite so familiar with um, yeah. you know, biosimilars and the term. Yeah. So so they are somewhat. Uh, it's not exactly the same as a generic for a tablet. So um, so a generic tablet is essentially uh, a, a a a drug that that is produced uh, that has the same formula as the original molecule. Uh, and then, um, uh, because it's 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 produced by, you know, as as a generic, it's much cheaper than the, than the original molecule. Um, uh, the production of biosimilars is a bit more complicated because the biologicals are these protein drugs, so so they are not synthesized uh, chemically, but you use um, cell uh, producer cell lines, and and the 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 quality of the molecule uh, is determined by what type of cell line is used, what the conditions are, because there are a number of modifications that these cell lines add to these to these antibodies. And, and so, so therefore, uh, uh, the, the whole process of, of, um, of producing biosimilars is, uh, is a bit more complicated. And it's also the reason why we don't call them generics, because they are not structurally not 100% identical to the, the original molecule. Yeah, so so that's the reason why we call them biosimilars and not not generics. Um, uh, but the the, uh, the the companies that make these biosimilars, they have to demonstrate that the that the drugs so they, they have the same amino acid sequence because they are proteins, and they have to demonstrate that um, they have the same uh, a similar efficacy to the original molecule, um, and um, and and then. Um, they, they are often uh, um, uh, then substituted uh, for the for the original molecule. Uh, unfortunately, um, the, the the cost savings don't appear. They are not as dramatic as with the generic drugs. So in in many cases, um, the um, the biologics still are quite expensive. Right. The biosimilars. Sorry. Bio biosimilars. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what can we talk about in terms of uh, research studies or, or just, you know, your experience with people going into remission um, thanks to biologics or other medications? And then, uh, you know, if there is um, if there is study on this, if there is, you know, data pointing that this does happen, does going off the biologic then, you know, maintain the, the remission or are people prone to, to relapse into more active disease? Yeah, it's an, an important question. Um, and I actually had a couple of slides in the presentation that I then took out to, uh, so to not go over time too much. Um, so there have been uh, uh, a number of clinical trials that looked at this. So, so the, these were quite rigorously performed. So the design was the following. Um, so they treated patients with, with ankylosing spondylitis, or in one case also axial spondyloarthritis, um, with a biologic. And then those patients whose disease responded well and they were uh, it had a low disease activity, um, they were then randomized to either continue the drug or to take placebo. But it was also done in a double blind fashion. So the, the, the study participants didn't know whether they continued the, the medication or whether they were randomized to placebo. And then they were followed for about one year and so uh, the, the results between the studies were r roughly the same. So um, there, there was a substantially higher number of patients who flared that were in the placebo arm. And so after one year, uh, about 50 to 75 percent. Now this, this is a rough number that I'm that I'm that I'm uh, saying here. So 50 to 75 percent of, of those patients who who were switched to placebo, they had a disease flare. Which means on the flip side that there were 25 to 50 percent, so about one third, who were still doing well, even though they um, had only injected the placebo for for one year. So so that means that, uh, you know, there is a certain chance that, you know, if you're doing well, uh, that you can stop the medication and um, it will not come back immediately. Obviously, we don't know what happens 
during a longer observation period, you know, after a year and a half or two years, because the studies only uh, uh, looked at a course of one year. Um, one other important factor here is also that in those studies, they, they also looked at what happens when those patients who had a flare after they were switched to placebo, um, did they regain control of, of disease activity? And in most cases, that was, that was actually true. So, so the patients who got switched to placebo that had a flare and then restarted their medication, in most cases, they uh, uh, did well and they went back into, into low disease activity. So, um, you know, that is certainly, I think, an, an, an option that is available if, uh, um, you know, if, if someone is, is, is doing well. Um, but there is a, a risk associated with it. And I, I had over the course of the last year, two patients where we actually uh, tried that. Um, and in both cases, symptoms came back within three to six months and we restarted the, the biologic because um, um, ultimately what, what we're doing is we're, we're treating the disease um, but in most cases, we don't cure the disease with the medications that we have currently available. Right. Thank you so much. Um, two, two, I think we have time for two final questions. Um, so start sticking to the medications theme um, on the IL-17s at this point. If a patient takes Cosentec successfully for seven years, but then has reduced effectiveness, is another IL-17 then appropriate to try? once one IL-17 is failed. And then kind of a follow-up question to that, what is the next step after IELTS? Yeah, so, so I would actually uh, uh, favor, in this, in this particular scenario, I would favor uh, 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 trying uh, the, the other IL-17A inhibitor, the, the Ixikizumab, um, because uh, one likely explanation is that um, over time, treatment with the biologic resulted in these inactivating antibodies. And because of that, the drug doesn't work as well anymore. So the, the telltale sign of that is that symptoms sort of come back, you know, during the last few days before the next injection is due, and then things get better. And then, you know, before the next injection, the same thing happens. So, so that can be a sign that, that there is formation of these 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 anti-drug uh, antibodies and then switching to uh, a medication with the same mechanism of action uh, is is actually recommended um, because these inactivating antibodies will not cross react so they do not inactivate the, the new drug so in in this particular scenario that's what i would would suggest so so if this does not work so what are the options you know it depends on what is the um, the prior treatment history so was the uh, the um, the the Cosentix was that the the first biologic tried, or was the patient um, on um, you know one TNF inhibitor before or several TNF inhibitors before? So that then you know uh, the question is is it worth trying another TNF inhibitor? And then um, you know as 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 we discussed. Uh, we have now also the option of the uh, of the jack inhibitors. So, so there's another treatment option here. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's all of these things that need to be considered in then making um, discussing the options and between patient and 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 rheumatologist making a a, a treatment decision. Thank you so much. And I'll make this my final question. If we can discuss, and it's kind of a long one, if we can discuss the, or a large one, the long-term progression of spondyloarthritis, um, axial spa, as it relates to conditions common with the aging process, for instance, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, et cetera, um, what should people be looking out for? And you know, really what's seen in spondyloarthritis as one ages? Can you repeat the very last sentence? What is seen? What is seen in spondyloarthritis patients um, as they age? What what common complications, perhaps, or just kind of how does how does the axial disease itself um, progress usually, or is there usually? Um, well, so uh, uh, you know, I, I want to reiterate what I what I what I said in the in the presentation. So, what happens in the spine? 
uh, in, in patients with, um, with axial spondyloarthritis or AS uh, varies a lot between individuals. The, 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 the classical um, um, scenario in, in ankylosing spondylitis is that, that the syndesmophytes form that have a certain shape, so, so they're very thin um, and, and connect the, the adjacent vertebral bodies. Um, you can also get um, uh, calcification, ossification of, of ligaments in the spine and the, the small facet joint in the back of the spine can, can fuse. Um, and, and some of these uh, findings have a very typical appearance uh, compared to um, what, one was, when, what one sees with degenerative disease. Um, but, you know, th 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 it's, it's not always as clear cut as in a textbook. But I want to, you know, it's important to, 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 uh, to understand that um, uh, in, in, in case of, of axial spinal arthritis, the, the, the more common degenerative changes can also happen. So for instance, um, you know, someone, let's say with, with non-radiographic disease and, and uh, without, you know, the, the, the big changes in the SI joints, um, you, you can have a back pain uh, that is totally unrelated to the spinal arthritis. And um, people can have degenerative disc disease and facet arthropathy uh, that, that are more common with, with age, like uh, everyone else in the population who does not have spinal arthritis. Um, and so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's really, the, the, the question was a very open question. And so yeah. I, I think I have to, to give a very general answer, uh, which is it's not as straightforward always. So it, it really depends on when symptoms change, um, uh, uh, then it's important to to discuss that with the rheumatologists and see, um, you know, is this because of disease progression or is there a potentially different explanation um, for, for, for these symptoms? Because that can be the case. Thank you so much, Dr. Ehrman, for just this fantastic presentation, this really interesting Q&A session. We so appreciate you sharing your knowledge and expertise and, and time with us today.